Queek, 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 queek. A dream about my father chasing me through the fields with a pig sticker took an even more nightmarish turn when he started emitting a rhythmic high-pitched screech. Then I swam dizzily into full wakefulness to find an alarm sprite floating through the dormitory. It had to be an emergency. They didn't deploy alarm sprites lightly. It takes two fairly high-level mages to shut the damn things up. And I'd spent enough time at St. Gordon's Magical College to know that any emergency involving magic is something you want to get away from as fast as you can. After a minute of confused bustle in which dressing gowns were thrown on and several sets of slippers thudded their way downstairs, I, and the rest of the second years, followed the squealing ball of light into the entrance quad. The ear molesting noise was immediately joined by the screams of several other alarm sprites as the rest of the student body filed out into the pre-dawn gloom. That's when I knew that something was really wrong. An alarm in itself was not unusual, especially not in the second year dorm. After spending the entire first year learning theory and taking the mandatory psychological tests, students tend to be overly enthusiastic with their first firebolts, but a full evacuation of the entire student body, 57, and faculty, 4, wasn't usually necessary. Jim! called Mr. Everwind, my tutor. Sweat was dripping from the brim of his pointy hat. Line up the second years at the back! We were too rattled to do anything but obey, taking up position behind the third years. All the students had been arranged by year into a rather haphazard rectangle that didn't seem to have anything to do with the usual drill procedure. Suddenly, the sun began to rise, spilling orange dawn over the rolling green hills of the surrounding plains. I noticed that the horizon was a lot more textured than I remembered, and more bristling with siege weaponry. An army was advancing towards the school. Just as I had done on my first day, I deeply resented the fact that St. Gordon's Magical College was not, in fact, a castle. All right, chaps, settle down, said the headmaster, resplendent in his star-patterned cardigan as he strode back and forth in front of the student body. Let me assure you all that there is absolutely no reason to panic. The rising tension was not eased in the slightest. It's probably just some misunderstanding. Stop chewing, Haverson. But a Straganophian army appears to be attacking the college. Now, don't worry, you are only here as a precaution. We have enlisted a former graduate, Pony Leaf the Enchanter, and his adventuring party to aid us, and I want you to show them the same respect you show to me, understand? I said spit that out, boy! Pony Leaf was tall and thin, with a curly beard and the kind of rugged tan and fidgety nervousness that comes from her career adventuring through the Nolan Goblin haunted wilderness. He stepped forward, separating himself from a bored looking Lovedian dwarf and a poorly dressed anorexian warrioress who looked chilly in every sense of the word. <coughs> Good morning, he said with a cough, turning his staff over in his hands. A furious ongoing roar was slowly edging into earshot, punctuated by the clash of swords against shields. Good morning, Mr. Ponyleaf, droned the bewildered student body doubtfully. Now, what we're dealing with here is a loose alliance of student fighters from the warrior schools just over the border in Straganoff. Obviously, not much of a match for veteran adventurers like us. They're here because the King Straganoff has put out a quest to recover the Stone of Solomus that was left with this college by its founders hundreds of years ago. Now, obviously, we will never surrender the stone to such bully boy tactics, but I would ask that I and my fellows be allowed to look after the stone for its protection, and so that we can wave it at the enemy for purposes of psychological warfare. We don't have the stone, said the headmaster as Pony Leaf met his gauge hope hopefully. You what? We've only been open six years. There's no such thing as the Stone of Solomus. The king's mad. Last year he made his son marry a koi pond. An awkward silence passed. Or at least it would have been a silence were it not for the increasingly loud war cry and wet thudding of booted feet upon the de dewy morning grass. Not to mention the subtle clinking of light armor as the other two members of Ponyleaf's adventuring party attempted to shuffle towards the back gate unnoticed. Can I be perfectly frank, said Ponyleaf eventually? We're kind of only doing this because we were hoping you'd let us have the stone as a reward. Well, obviously that's not going to happen. No, no, I see that. He looked behind him and did a double take that was just a little bit too obvious. Sorry, it seems my colleagues have wandered off somewhere. I'm just going to see where they went and come right back. Then he left. Quickly. The frontmost rank of armored frat boys was now over the last hill and had broken into a run. The ground was quivering in almost perfect synchronization with my stomach. Right then, said the headmaster, tight-lipped, eyes fixed on the fence over which Ponyleaf had just vaulted. I know most of you don't, didn't really expect to be practicing this level of combat magic this early in your career, but I think I can say that if I were an invading army, I'd certainly be given pause for concern by such a formidable rank of enchanters as, God damn it, Haverson, I told you once before, but... <coughs> The vibrating rear half of an arrow suddenly appeared in his temple. He concluded his sentence with a few spit bubbles before falling over. 
A large chunk of our defense force took this as the invitation to run away. But I didn't. Furious tears were forming in my eyes. I'd spent my last vegetable tray on tuition fees. Home was at least five turnips worth of journey away, and more to the point, the last place I wanted to go. St. Gordon's might not have been the most prestigious magic college in the world, and its graduates generally couldn't entertain any ambitions beyond running a pest control business, but it was all I had. The creaky wooden gates were pulverized into splinters under a whirling cloud of iron boots and training war hammers. I extended a hand and began to account. Arcanus! Infernus! T I don't actually remember if I was able to get a firebolt off. I have a vague memory of seeing orange light splatter harmlessly against a spiked breastplate, but that might just have been sparks from all the metal rubbing against metal. Then there was a sound rather like a bag of wet laundry being hurled across a gravel driveway, and that was the first time I died. Everything seems a whole lot more peaceful when you're dead. Even watching your own pelvis being kicked around the quad by guffawing adolescent berserkers has something transcendental about it when you're looking down on it from about six feet up and ascending. Maybe it was the way everything was tinted a strange bluish gray and seemed to be glowing with an eldritch light. As I continued to drift upwards, the world began to fade, the majestic sight of the warrior hordes breaking all of St. Gordon's front windows blurred and not just from distance. At the point of death, all sound had suddenly crashed into silence, as if I'd thrust my head into ice-cold water, but now the quiet was somehow deepening. What I had previously accepted to be complete silence was a cacophony compared to what I wasn't hearing now. The land of the living was still there, barely. It had been reduced to a collection of dim shadows that were almost invisible against the cosmic brilliance of the beyond. What I remember most vividly of all is the light. Bright as anything, and my ghostly eyes were open wide, but it didn't dazzle me. It wasn't just the light at the end of the tunnel, unless the tunnel was also made of light. It was everywhere, all around me, and I was part of it. I was watching the light, and at the same time, I was the light watching me. I think I was still ascending, but it was becoming harder and harder to tell. The world was turning below me, reduced to little more than a faint smear against the light. I saw the college, the surrounding county, and the lands of Straganov toiling under the heel of demented monarchs. I saw the kingdom of Beauregard, where I had been born, along with all its neighboring territories, their ancient borders and writhing battlegrounds now made meaningless. I saw the entire continent of Garethi, a thousand rural hues of brownish-green and greenish-brown spreading from ocean to ocean like rotting seaweed on a calm beach. I saw the entire planet, from the jungles of anorexia to the urban sprawl of Lalade City. I saw the glittering sphere hanging in the blackest darkness, and somewhere at the back of my mind, I realized that Flat World Frobisher owed me twenty quid. I could see it all, but I was still ascending. The world of my birth shrank from a planet to a moon, to a beach ball, to a pea, to a grain of sand, to... gone. Now there was nothing but the light, and a new sound was drifting through the stillness. A beautiful voice was calling me, singing songs of beckoning, and as the delicate tones passed my ears, I felt a giddy and instinctive state of rapturous love. For just a few more songs, I would have done anything for that voice. I would have... well, I wouldn't have died for it, obviously. I was ahead of the game there. The light took form around me, breaking off bits of itself like clay and reshaping them to... what else could they have been? Angels. Their blank, featureless faces were strangely beautiful, shining with a golden inner light. They took my spectral arms, holding them ever so gently, and aided my ascent. Their every touch, every movement, every sound they breathed into my ears all communicated the same thing. Love, undying and powerful. I had passed on from life, from the world of struggles and hardship and big fat women with annoying laughs, and entered a glorious new existence of utter peace and joy and love. And then some git brought me back to life. 